All right. If you were here last week, you'll remember, or not last week, but two weeks ago, uh, I didn't finish through Matthew chapter 12 because there was a couple of points that I really wanted to make sure got across through the sermon last week. So we're actually going to pick up in Matthew 12 where we left off. And there's just, there's so much content in all of these chapters. I'm already scratching the surface. I'm going to do my best to just get through all of Matthew 13 again tonight. Um, so bear with me. And, but that also means that there's going to be some stuff I'm just simply not going to be able to expound upon completely. So I picked a few things, again, out of Matthew chapter 13 also that I want to cover. But I'm, I'm still going to do my best to try to go through verse by verse and at least give a little bit for, for everything that we cover. So flip back, if you would, to Matthew chapter 12. And we're going to pick up in verse number 35. We, we, this is kind of where we left off last time because I really covered a lot about the reprobate doctrine last week. The Bible says in verse number 35, a good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. A very strong, stern warning about just the words that come out of your mouth saying, you know, every idle word that men shall speak, they're going to give account thereof in the day of judgment. People say a lot of really stupid, flippant things about God, about the Bible, about Jesus, and they make a mock and they think it's so funny. But Jesus is warning, you know, hey, be careful with the things that you say, even if you, you, you think they're not, you know, they're funny or it's not that big of a deal or whatever. And of course, this comes off the tail end of them saying, you're just casting out devils by the prince of the devils, by Beelzebub, right? He's referring still in the context of people who are, uh, you know, casting out his name and casting out the name of, of God just and just being disdainful towards everything that he's doing. And this is why, you know, he's talking about... Um, giving account of those words in the day of judgment. We know that as believers, the things that we say, you know, even all the sinful things that we say and do, they're all forgiven through Christ. So in the day of judgment that this is referring to, this is referring to, you know, God casting people into the lake of fire. This isn't referring to like the judgment seat of Christ. And he says, for by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by the words thou shalt be condemned. Why are we justified or condemned by our words? Because if you call on the name, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And when you're saved, you're justified in the eyes of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what saves you. That's what justifies you. So calling on God, hey, those words right there save you. But every other words, all the other things, all the other wicked, sinful things that people say and do, you know, that's ultimately going to condemn them. So this is something that people really ought to take more seriously. And that's a stern warning right there. But let's keep reading here. Verse number 38, the Bible says, Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So these Pharisees here, right after he gets done telling them, hey, you know, be careful with the things that you say because that's going to come up and bite you and that's what, you know, that's ultimately going to condemn you. And they're saying, well, we need to see a sign as if he hasn't already been doing all of these works anyways. And he's basically, here, he's just calling them wicked. You know what? An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. You just, you just want to see these signs. And, and, and of course, they're seeking after a sign that's never going to be good enough for them. No matter what he does, they're never going to just receive it and believe. And he says, you know what? There's no sign that's going to be given to you but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And obviously, that's a, he's referring to Jonas here. And I've preached on this before, on, on the fact that Jesus Christ's soul went to hell. And one of the ways, and I'm not going to get into that tonight either. That's a, that's a whole other topic for another day, but I'm going to briefly mention it here. 
Jesus brings up Jonas. Gina, Jesus brings up the fact that Jonah was a prophet and he prophesied of something that was a sign that was still going to be given because he was going to go through it, through it. He says, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so he's equating what happened when Jonah was in the whale's belly for those three days and three nights and saying the same way that he was in that belly, the son of man, he says, so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, when you read the story of Jonah, Jonah was not three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The heart is in the center, right? It's in the middle, the heart of a human being, the heart of any animal is going to be kind of right in the middle of their chest, right smack dab in the middle of their body. You know, the heart of, of uh, fruit, to, you know, of avocado heart, it's right in the center. It's at the core. The heart of the earth is hell. That's where hell is located. It's in the center of the earth. If you were to, to slice the earth open, the globe, earth, you were to slice it open right in the middle into that eternal pit because all the force of gravity when you get down to the middle is, is there's your, it's weightlessness there and it never ends. That is hell. And that's where the Son of Man went and the reason why I'm bringing up all this about Jonah is because Jesus brought up about Jonah. And when you read Jonah, especially in Jonah chapter number two, you get these descriptions of Jonah saying, out of the, out of the whale's belly cried I, out of the belly of hell cried I. And he's prophesying the fact that Jesus Christ was going to go to hell. And you can read through that and you see it's torment, it's torture. The earth with her bars was about me forever. These are visions of Jesus Christ's soul being in hell. So when people try to tell you, oh no, that's just some different place, that's Abraham's bosom, that's this, that's that, other than just what the Bible always refers to as hell being a bad place, you can show them Matthew chapter 12 and say, well, look, Jesus prophesied that the Son of Man is going to be in the heart of the earth. And then we can go back and look at Jonah because he referenced Jonah in the, the, of the same, during the same event that he was going to be in the heart of the earth. Let's see what Jonah had to say about this because Jonah was a prophet. Jonah prophesied about the Son of Man going into the heart of the earth. Let's see what his account shows of how that went. And you'll see that it wasn't just this place where saved people were hanging out. There was nothing good about Jonah being three days and three nights in the whale's belly. Neither prophetically nor physically. And I brought this up before too. I mean, imagine being in a whale's belly. It's darkness. It's going to be complete and utter darkness. There is no light inside of an animal's belly. You're also going to have all the digestive fluids and stomach acids and things like that that are going on in the whale's belly. And I'm sure a stench of rotting dead fish and seaweed and whatever else is inside of that whale's belly. And you're just engulfed in this organ, in this, in this stomach. Like, that is not pleasant at all. That doesn't sound like Abraham's bosom to me either. And that was a picture, that was a representation of Jesus Christ being in the heart of the earth. It was not a good place to be. But anyways, let's move on. I don't want, I could spend the entire night preaching on this subject. There's so much evidence in the scripture that Jesus Christ's soul went to hell because what the Bible actually says, and nowhere does the Bible say that hell is a good place. And you call me a heretic, you call me whatever you want for believing the Bible, but I'm not going to change what I believe or back down from that doctrine. I think it's a very important doctrine to, to stand, stand strong on because it's clear. This isn't, this isn't a matter of opinion on, oh, what does this verse mean? And it's kind of ambiguous and you don't quite know. There is nothing ambiguous or unclear about the doctrine of Jesus Christ's soul going to hell. That is very clearly documented in Scripture. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 41. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. And he continues on with his reference to Jonah because right, Jonah went to go preach to Nineveh. And he's telling Nineveh how wicked they are. He says, yet 40 days and God shall destroy Nineveh. That was his message. He's warning them and saying, hey, in 40 days, you guys are toast. God is going to bring destruction upon Nineveh. And, and Jesus is saying, you know what? Those wicked people that were in Nineveh, they're going to rise up and they're going to be able to judge you guys. Why? 
Because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. Because when Jonah came in and said, hey, you guys are wicked, you need to repent, God's going to destroy this place, they repented. They actually received the word. They believed it. And they got right with God. And God spared them. He's saying, even though they were wicked, they received the word, they repented, and God spared them. Therefore, they're going to judge you, he says, because behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Jesus Christ is so much greater than the prophet Jonah was. And, he's, and you're not repenting at the preaching of Jesus. So those people have a lot to be able to judge over you. All they had was Jonah to hear. But they still received it. You have the Son of God, and you're still not receiving it. And then he brings up the, the, the Queen of the South here, verse 142, The Queen of the South shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Solomon had the most wisdom in the, in the whole world. And, and, you know, the, the queen of Sheba came up to hear, just to, just to hear, man, I've heard about this guy, I've heard about his kingdom, but she said, I'm going to make this travel, I'm going to go and just to hear what he has to say, just to hear his great wisdom, and makes all this effort to go and just hear this person who has great wisdom. How much more wisdom does Jesus Christ have than, than Solomon had? Infinite. He said, she's going to judge you guys after everything that they're saying about Jesus Christ and saying that he's of the devil? Verse 43, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out, and when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Now, I don't know if you've ever had problems understanding this verse. For a long time, I had a problem understanding this, and mostly just because of the pronouns, the he and the him and the spirit, and like, what is this talking about? But it's actually really, it's, it's pretty straightforward. So let's go through this real quickly. Verse number 43, it says, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man. Now you can go all throughout the scripture. When you see there's an unclean spirit, it's a devil. Someone's possessed with a devil. Very clear, easily provable. You can go through all the gospels especially and see someone has an unclean spirit. Unclean spirits are being cast out. This is talking about someone being possessed of a devil. This is talking about that devil leaving a man. So a man's possessed, the devil goes out. The unclean spirit goes out. The he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none is the unclean spirit. The unclean spirit is left and the unclean spirit's now going about and going <laughs> wherever, wandering about to and fro in the earth and he's not finding any rest. So he's like, well, you know what? When he says, I will return into my house from whence I came, he's talking about the man that he was possessing where he was dwelling in. He's like, I'm going to go back and just live inside of that guy and possess that guy again. So it says here, it says, when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. It's picked up, he's cleaned up his life a little bit, whatever, right? Like the guy, the devil left, so now the guy is able to kind of clean things up in his life. He's got things cleaned up, you know, garnished, means he's like decorated, everything's swept, everything's kind of under control. He's got things going well. It says, then goeth he, this is talking about the spirit, then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. So now he, get, he gets more devils to go in and possess this guy. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. So what he's saying is that basically, you know, this generation is plagued, you know, with the devil or whatever. And there's a time where where this, this wicked spirit's gone, but then the spirit's going to come back and it's going to be way worse. So it's kind of like when Jesus comes on the scene, you know, he's casting out these devils and there's this respite from having, you know, a plague of, of evil coming upon the nation. Again, obviously this is a parable, so we're trying to relate the story to the greater picture of what he's talking about, this generation. And what he's saying is that, yeah, the generation was wicked before, and then Jesus shows up, but then it's going to be so much worse when Jesus is gone 
because of all the people that have ultimately just rejected it and all that wickedness is going to come back and then some. When people hear, and, and this I think ties in also just kind of with the reprobate thing, right? When people, people can be living a wicked lifestyle or whatever, and then they come to this, this, this knowledge of the gospel and this knowledge of Christ, but when they end up rejecting that, then they just start going on this downward spiral of just things getting way, way, way worse because they've just utterly rejected Jesus Christ. And that's what happens here. So you're saying, you know, a guy that's possessed with one devil that ends up leaving him alone, you know, that guy should have gotten saved then after that and really made sure he got things right and put his trust in the Lord because then... Because he didn't do that, now all these other devils came back, and that's just, just way worse. You know, the guys that were, that were living in the tombs and cutting themselves and crying out, they had the legion. They were way, I mean, there were people being brought to the disciples and having devils cast out just kind of regularly throughout the ministry. But these guys that had multiple devils in them, like, like they're just so far gone and out that they're just kind of living outside of, of the outskirts of town. They can't be around anybody because it's so bad having those multitude of devils living inside of them. And that's, that's the analogy he's giving us here. You know, someone that's got seven spirits, eight wicked, you know, unclean spirits living inside of them. The state of that man is, is really bad. And when the people, people reject Christ, you know, your sin that you had originally... It just compounds and gets so much worse than after that when you when you have the knowledge of God, but you reject God. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 46. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. And I love this statement by Jesus Christ. He's not dissing his family, right? That's because they said, like, hey, basically, he's preaching, he's teaching, and his literal, you know, fleshly family shows up. And he's told as he's teaching, like, hey, your mother and your brethren, they're, they're outside waiting for you, right? They're, they're here to see you. And he's like, well, who is my mother? And who are my brethren? And he, and he stretches out his hand. He's like, basically saying that you are. You are that are doing, you know, the will of my father, which is in heaven. You're my brother. You're my sister. You're my mother. He said, what a great, close, intimate relationship that Christ opens up for us. To say that he's gonna, you know, he's not ashamed to call us brethren, and that that still, I mean, no matter how many times I read this and, and read in other places, like that just astounds me, and it's very humbling to think how Jesus Christ can can open up that type of relationship with us to, to say, you know, you're my brethren. That's, a, that, that's really an incredible thing. Let's, let's continue now on into Matthew chapter 13. Verse number one. So this is, this is the parable. Of the, so this is an important subject. I'm going to try to cover this as in-depth as possible. It's, we're going to read through um, this parable, and then I'm going to preach on it a little bit here. Verse number one, the Bible says, The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. And great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. So he's just out by the seaside, and so many people showed up to hear him and to listen to him that he actually had to go out on a boat and in order to speak to everybody so that everyone could hear him. And obviously when you go on a boat, like you're gonna be able to project your voice more, everyone else on the sea is gonna be able to hear him, and he's gonna have kind of a, a stage set up on the boat for everyone to be able to hear him. And it says it's great multitudes. Great multitudes were gathered. And all these kind of people just wanted to hear the wisdom of Jesus Christ. Verse number three, the uh, Bible says, And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, 
and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And I covered this when we went over Matthew 12. So I'm not going to get into this at all. We'll read over the verses, but I'm not going to explain all that again because he's literally keeping some truth from them because it, some of those people were reprobate. And he's, and he's just telling them in parables so they don't understand. And when you read a parable like this, if that's all we had to go on, I mean, you really wouldn't know exactly what he's talking about. You'd be reading that and going like, well, I mean, a lot of people might have different opinions and stuff on it, but it wouldn't be very easy because this is more of a dark saying until he shines the light on it when he expounds it unto his disciples, which is exactly what he does. He says, well, I'll explain it unto you, but it's not for everybody to know. And it lines up with the natural man receiveth not the things of God. People who are not born again, they're not going to be able to understand the Bible. When they read the Bible, it's going to be kind of like this parable to them. You might be able to pick out some things and you could find some truth and you can, you know, kind of stumble around a little bit and, and have your hands out and go, oh, yeah, I'd... but it's all going to be dark to them. It's not going to, their, 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 their mind is not enlightened with the scripture until after you're born again. So uh, they ask, well, why are you speaking to them in parables? Verse 10, verse 11, he answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. And he's, he's telling them now that they're basically really lucky to be with him because there's plenty of prophets and people of older time in the Old Testament. Man, they would have they loved to sit under the teaching and preaching of Jesus and have all this, the word of God just expounded on them and completely explained because they didn't have that luxury. They didn't have all the stuff that we even, you know, especially that we get to enjoy in the New Testament. So much more understanding and knowledge has been given unto us than what people had previously. So now he's going to explain the parable of the sower. And this is a parable. The reason why I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this is because many people just get this wrong. And many people will use this parable to teach bad doctrine about salvation. And I, I, I'm going to say this every time this comes up in preaching at all in the Bible. Watch out for people who are basing doctrine on parables in the Bible. You cannot use a parable to, to nail down a doctrine. You have to have clear statements because even here, Jesus is going to explain it, but people still get it wrong. And that's kind of mind-boggling that he's explaining it and people will still take the explanation and say, well, no, no, see, this is, you know, none of these people are saved except for the last group. And that's just simply not true. And, and what they end up doing with this then is they start backing in works and how, oh, you need to live a certain way and if you don't live that way, then you really weren't saved and, and things like that based off of a parable. But let's read his, Jesus Christ's explanation of this parable. Because he's saying, you know, a sower goes out to sow and he's, he's sowing his seed in the ground. He's like, some of it's just, just it, it falls on stony ground. He didn't even intend to, to sow his seed there. It's not a good place to sow the seed, but that's where it lands. Some of it goes into the, um, you know, into the good ground, and other go into the stony ground. But um, he, we're going to see here, 
how, what the explanation is behind the story. So uh, verse number 19, verse number 18, the Bible says, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. The seed that just fell out that wasn't really, you know, properly sown. It just kind of fell out of the bag, right? And he's saying when someone hears the word of God, they hear the word, they hear the gospel, but they don't understand it. That's like this seed that just, just falls by the wayside. This is what happens. We go out soul winning. This happens all the time. Every day we go out soul winning. There's people that just don't get it. They just don't understand. So this is a seed that just falls by the wayside. And unfortunately, I mean, about, Jesus tells us further, though, that the wicked one comes and he takes away that seed that was sown in their heart. Because when we go out soul winning, we are sowing the seed of the word of God in people's hearts. This very first group, they don't understand it, and that seed is removed. Very clear, these people are not saved. Very clear. But now let's move on to the next one. Verse number 20. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. So what do we, if you want to know if someone's saved, what are you going to ask? Well, how shall they hear without a preacher, right? And how shall they believe except they hear? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. They call by hearing and believing, right? Receiving. So they receive the word with joy. They're happy about it. Yeah, they hear it. That's great. I'm going to receive that. This isn't, this goes beyond just understanding. It doesn't say they understood it, but they threw it away. It says they understood it and then they gladly received it. You know, we refer to salvation as a free gift because the Bible talks about it being a free gift. It's really easy to understand that we always go through these illustrations. Hey, if I were to give you this gift, you know, I could offer this gift to you all day, but what do you have to do? You have to take it. You have to receive it, right? That's an illustration of salvation. It's up to the person to receive the free gift. But once they receive it, hey, it's eternal. It's everlasting. It lasts forever. So in this story, you have a person that hears the word and they're happy about receiving the seed, the word of God. They're happy about receiving it. Are these people saved or not saved? Clearly, they're saved. The seed is being referred to as the word of God in this parable. The Bible says here, I'm going to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 real quick. You know the verse, very famous verse, but 1 Peter chapter 1 just to give ample support for what this parable is teaching for those people who, who just can't understand Jesus Christ's explanation. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 23, the Bible reads, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. We are born again of the incorruptible seed, which is the word of God. The sower is sowing the word of God. That is the seed. It's referred to as a seed, and that's what, what do we need to do to be saved? We need to receive the word of God. This person received the seed. They're born again because they're born again of incorruptible seed. They received the seed. It, it, it's such an easy concept. I don't know how people get this so wrong. You know why they get it wrong? Is because they like looking on people's works to determine if they're saved. They like just looking at works. They, well, works prove salvation. Works do not prove salvation. Amen. Belief. Yeah. Faith. That's, right. Amen. That's all it is. That's what saves you in the first place. So it's not, it's not works that save you. So why am I going to look at works to see if you're saved? So it says here, this person, they receive it. But, verse 21, yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth 
for a while, for when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by, he is offended. Now, has anyone here ever been themselves or ever known anyone who has gotten saved, but then they experienced some tribulation from family or friends, and they weren't able to take it, so they stopped going maybe to a good church, or they, you know, they kind of got out of, of practicing and living a way that God would want them to live because they couldn't handle that? Has anyone ever known anyone like that? Yeah, it happens a lot. Does that mean that person, well, they just must not have been saved then because the persecution got to them. Think about it this way. What would be the point of persecution if every single person who really believed would never crumble and never fall at persecution. Because that would be the flip side to this argument of saying, oh, well, there's no way they were saved because, you know, they, when, when tribulation and persecution arose because of the word, they were offended. Jesus Christ even asked his own, you know, he had disciples following him. He says, does this offend you? And many people stopped following from that point on. Does that mean they never got saved originally because they stopped following him? No. They stopped being his disciple because being a disciple means you're following, but it doesn't mean they weren't saved. Because salvation is easy. You don't have to follow Christ and walk in his footsteps and do as he did in order to be saved. You just have to receive a free gift. That simple. So when people fail, when people are persecuted, when people are weak and they can't stand up for their faith, that doesn't make them unsaved. It's wrong. It's a sin. They shouldn't do it. They're like this seed that's, you know, in the stony places. But the seed still brought forth life in those stony places. And once you have that new life, that's everlasting life. It didn't grow. It didn't thrive. It didn't do everything that it was planted to do. But the life was still there. The tree, the plant that was there, that life was of the seed that was sown. And that's why the Bible is very clear about the fruit, you know, that, that a, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, an evil tree cannot bring forth good fruit. They're two completely separate things. So whatever you're born of is the type of, of person or life that you have or that you are. And when you're born of the good seed, whether or not you're bringing forth fruit, you're of the right tree. You're not an evil tree. So it says here, tribulation, persecution rises because the word by and by is offended. Verse 22, he also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. Again, anyone ever know anyone who got in church for a while, they got saved, they got baptized, they're living right, they're going out soul winning, but after a while, you know, work just became too important for them. And they just got, got caught up in, in all of the things and money and what the world has to offer and whatever the cares are and going to sporting events and doing this and doing that that has gotten them out of church and they want to just have more fun than serve God. Whether that mean earning money or going out and having entertainment or what have you. Does that mean that person's not saved? No, of course not. But that happens. And notice, it says he becometh unfruitful, which means, that implies, he was fruitful. Yeah. This is someone who was fruitful, who is bearing fruit. So I don't know how anyone could look at this and say, okay, they received the seed, the word of God that was sown in their heart, and now they've become fruitful. And you can see that it's good fruit because of the seed that they were born from. But now all of a sudden they just stopped bearing fruit. The, fruit, the tree kind of dried up a little bit and stopped bearing fruit. Well, as Jesus said to the fig tree, you know, I'm going to take you away, but it doesn't mean it wasn't still a fig tree. And the person who is saved that stops it, if I were to stop winning souls and stop leading people to Christ and just stop bearing fruit, it's not like, oh, well, Pastor Burns was never saved then. No, of course, obviously, he was never saved. So let's forget about all those years and everything else that he did, you know, because now, now he's at this point where it's clear he wasn't saved. That's ridiculous and stupid. And it doesn't hold any water. 
And then, of course, this last verse, verse 23, but he that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. So this is, these are the people that, that, that root, you know, root down, built up, and become fruitful trees. And some more than others. Just some trees produce more fruit than other trees. Some believers here, they're going to they're gonna do more works. They're going to bear more fruit than other people. And I think, honestly, I think that's the main point of this. I've heard a lot of people kind of go in depth on the 30, 60, 100 fold. I don't think that means 30 souls a year, 60 souls a year, 100. I think that's just showing that there's varying levels of how much fruit people are kind of producing, you know. I don't think it was meant to be like taken as an exact number. Now, I do think it's probably annually, just like, you know, trees produce fruit regularly, annually, whatever, and you're going to continue to do things like that. But the bottom line is just some people, some trees are bringing forth more fruit than others. And obviously, we want to be bringing forth as much fruit as we can. So. I don't want to get too much more in depth on that. I really just want to cover the, the salvation aspect of it because that's what he's teaching here. Um, three out of the four are saved. The one who didn't receive, who didn't understand, didn't receive the seed, they weren't saved. Everyone else says they received the seed. They received it. They received it. They received it. Once you receive the seed, you're born again. You got a new life. That new life is everlasting. It's eternal. It never ends. So even though your body physically dies, that new life doesn't ever die. That's the promise that Jesus Christ gave us, the promise that God gave us. Now, also what we're going to see here in Matthew chapter 13, I, I really want to cover this point also. We're going to see references to the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. And this is something that dispensationalists really like to focus in on. The kingdom of heaven, the phrase, the kingdom of heaven is only found in the book of Matthew. Okay? Now, we've got four Gospels, four accounts, eyewitness accounts of the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. All right? You've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They are covering, for the most part, the same events. Now, some might have a little bit more information than others, and, and one might cover a different story than some others do, but overall, we've got overlap in many, many, many places we're seeing stories being told just from different human authors giving their account of what happened. All of it's the Word of God. All of it's without error. All of it is truth and, and perfect and reliable. But in one of those accounts, we have Matthew using the phrase, Kingdom of Heaven, Kingdom of Heaven, Kingdom of Heaven. And what we find in other places is that instead of Kingdom of Heaven, they use kingdom of God. And like I said, people, dispensationalists primarily, want to hone in on this and say, see, no, look, the kingdom of heaven is something different. Jesus was preaching the kingdom of heaven, but then Paul was preaching the kingdom of God, and they like to tell you that there's different kingdoms and different salvations and all this different stuff going on, all this confusion in the manner of really short period of time, especially, well, things were just changing here, and he's, he's teaching on the kingdom of heaven back here, and the kingdom of God over here, and the kingdom of heaven. Oh, oh you silly person. You, you think that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are the same thing? It's the same kingdom. Amen. It's the same king. Amen. Who do you think is the king of heaven? It's God. Right. Well, who's the king in the kingdom of God? It's God. If you got the same king, you're going to have the same kingdom. Because that's just the area that he rules over. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are used interchangeably in the scripture. It matters not which phrase is used. And we'll prove this to you because we have so many. Now, I'm, I'm not even going to go through all these. I went through the various accounts and matched up. I'm going to just stick with well, I'm going to go through as many as I can. You don't have to turn there, but in Matthew chapter 4, we have a reference to the kingdom of heaven. It says, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it was, Oh, see, Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven. But when you look up the same event in, Ma in Mark chapter 1, because this, this happened, and you could, you could easily see that they're talking about the same 
the same time, the same place, it's the same thing happening because John was put into prison. In, Ma in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is, is saying these things after John sent into prison. Mark 1.14, now after that John was put into prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And again, you can line these up and figure it out for yourself. I'm not going to go through all these and, and spell it out for you. Verse 15, saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So Jesus said in Matthew 4, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And in Mark 1, he says, repent ye and believe the gospel. He says, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Interchangeable. Matthew 11, 11 says, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Right? We covered that a few weeks ago. Matthew 11. He that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Luke 7, 28. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Two totally different things even though it's the exact same sentence. It's the same kingdom. Matthew 13, 11, He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Mark 4, 10, And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable, and he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. Same thing. Matthew 13, verse 31. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. Mark 4, 30. And he said, unto, and he said Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God, or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. And on and on, for sake of time, I'm not going to go through the rest of these. If you're interested in seeing them, you can look it up later or just do a simple word study for yourself. Easily provable, uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the, the words are just used interchangeably. So don't let some false teacher come along and try to twist your mind up and, oh man, look at all this stuff. There's, there's nothing to see here. <laughs> it's, really, it's really, really, really simple. And when the Bible uses different words in like these quotes or whatever, or like when you're quoting Old Testament from the New, you know, in, the New Testament is quoting the Old Testament, things like that, you say, oh, well, they use this word instead of this word. All that means is that they mean the exact same thing. It's a synonym. That's it. That, that, that's, that is the extent of, of that. It's a synonym. And you know what? That teaches us many things too. Just like when the Bible says that... Um, um, a virgin shall conceive and a virgin is going to be with child. Conceive means with child. Birth is, you know, or life begins at conception. Once you conceive, you're with child. So you see things like that where the Bible is using, you know, slightly different wording, but it's, but it's the same exact concept, the same exact thought, same exact truth. Just using synonyms. Same thing with this. All right, let's move on here. Matthew 13, look at verse number 24. We're going to look at some more uh, parables. Matthew 13, verse 24, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then ap appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So, this parable, he's going to explain this parable later on, saying that this is referring to the end of the world and everything else. We'll get to that in a little bit. There's so much we can learn from this. Again, I'm going to try to cover this briefly. But basically what happens is he said he's likening the kingdom of heaven to this story, to this parable. This man goes out into his field and he sows good seed. Right? I'm planting wheat. I've got this whole field. I want to have a great wheat harvest, so I go out and plant wheat. 
It says, while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. So these wicked people come along. Go, <laughs> I'm going to screw up this guy's harvest. I'm going to screw up his field. I'm just, I'm just going to cause problems for him. And this is what wicked people do. They can't sleep until they've done some mischief. So they're up late. These guys worked hard all day. While they're sleeping, the enemy comes in and goes, I'm going to screw up everything that he's working for and, and, and trying to do. So then, you know, they're, they're taking, he's mending the ground, taking care of it, making sure everything's watered. And as the, the, the wheat begins to grow and, and starts to bear some fruit, they notice, oh man, there's these tears. Like, how did, how did this happen? How did all these weeds get here? How did all these tears get here? How, how is this coming up with our crops? What are we going to do about this? You know, we don't want the, the weeds and the tares choking out the good seed. They say, well, at this point now, there's nothing we can do. Because if you go up and try to uproot all of the tares, you might also end up uprooting the good, the good fruit, the, the wheat. You, know, you, you don't want to ruin that. So all we can do is just let them both grow together. And this is what God has allowed to happen here. We've got children of God and children of the devil living on the same field, growing up together. But there's going to come a time at the harvest when God's going to deal with those tares. When God is going to, hey, everyone's going to be reaped. The tares are going to be cast into the fire pit. And the wheat's going to be brought home. And, and that's what he's describing here. But notice, what, you know, the verse says, but while men slept. And there's so much, even just on that one phrase you could go into. You know, obviously we're children of the day. We should walk in the day. And then the, the, the children of darkness, the children of night, they do things, evil things at bad hours. But at the same time, you know, we ought to be vigilant and not sleep and not be drunken, Right? but just kind of be vigilant and be aware and, and on guard against these children of the devil who are going to come and try in and, and come in and, and screw everything up and screw up your harvest and screw, you know, trying to, to cause you not to bear fruit. So, um, you know, again, there's, there's so much here. I, I, want, I, need, I really want to get through this chapter, so let's move on. Uh, verse number 31, he brings up another parable. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. So he's talking about a mustard seed. He says, this is like this the really small seed, smallest among all the seeds, yet when it grows, it turns into this great plant, this great tree that, you know, it's a home for birds and all this other stuff. It really produces a lot. Um, and he's likening this to the kingdom of heaven. So, so far, these two parables have to do with the kingdom of heaven. Verse number 33, another parable speaking unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. All three of these parables are put together because Jesus is essentially teaching the same truth using all three of these parables. Now, the kingdom of heaven, there's many things that Jesus Christ can teach about the kingdom of heaven. And we're actually going to see a few more parables that give us a different aspect and a different truth that these parables don't present, right? But these ones are all kind of grouped together, hitting on the same point. So, you don't just take one parable and say, well, this just completely describes all about the kingdom of heaven. No, there's, there's one small truth about the kingdom of heaven that he's teaching within these parables, right? And he's trying to drive a point home about it. And what we're seeing in all of these is that just using something very small, like a seed or like leaven, because in, in both situations, it's a really small seed, but then it's going to grow up and bring forth a lot. You've got a little bit of leaven, but when you mix it in with, with the rest, of the, all of it becomes leaven, right? There's this exponential growth from a really, really small place. That is what he's likening the kingdom of heaven to. It starts off really small, but then grows into something great. And this is just the old, you know, the, the, the application or the, the thought, the truth that he's trying to get across about the kingdom of heaven. 
And it's the same way with our own spiritual lives, too. It starts off small. It starts off with the seed, the Word of God. Right? And that's where the life starts, but then grows up and builds up into something so much more. Amen. And um, even the kingdom, God's kingdom, you know, starts off small, but multiplies and brings forth more fruit and grows and grows into something much bigger. And by the way, it's something worth waiting for, you know, all these things. It takes time for, for the, the seed to plant, to grow, but in the end, the outcome is going to be so much greater and better than expected. Just like, you know, I don't think that we can fully appreciate and understand how awesome the kingdom of God is going to be when we enter into God's kingdom here on earth. And it's just going to be magnificent, amazing. Wow, I never expected it to be like this. It's so much better than I could even dream or think that it was going to be so much bigger so you know and it all starts with something very small uh, let's keep reading here verse number 34 and all these all these things spake jesus unto the multitudes in parables and without a parable spake he not unto them that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying i will open my mouth in parables i will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world so he already explained once why he's, he was using parables Another reason, not because that wasn't the only reason, another reason is fulfilling more prophecy, fulfilling more scripture. And this quotation in Matthew 13, 35 comes from Psalm 78, verse 2, where the Bible reads, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. So the prophecy came all the way back in the book of Psalms. And here Jesus Christ is uh, opening his mouth in parables. And, and uttering dark sayings of old and expounding upon those dark sayings of old as well. Matthew 13, let's keep reading here, verse number 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. So now he's going to give his explanation for that, for that other parable that, that I went through kind of already. Verse number 37, he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. So again, Jesus Christ is the one who's sowing the good seed. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. And again, notice the references to just the, say, the, the righteous and the wicked. The children of God, the children of the devil. There's these two polar opposites, these two extremes. Righteous, reprobate. And he's saying, this is the, the whole world is the field. And you've got good seed and you've got bad seed. Tares are children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. That's why he calls the reprobates sons of Belial, children of the devil. Because they're born again, they're born of bad seed. And they bear bad fruit and they'll never bear good fruit. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of, the wor of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth, as the son in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, some people will say, well, wait a minute, Pastor Bersons, I thought that, you know, like we get raptured first and then people get thrown into this lake of fire. Well, what happens to the believers at the end of the world? Because that's what it's talking about, the end of the world. This, I don't think this is talking about the rapture, even though it could use the same terminology, you know, like, the angels reaping, because the angels do reap at the rapture, but that's just the, uh, the first resurrection. There's also a second resurrection where when God's going to destroy, literally be the end of the world, that's the same event as the judgment seat of Christ. So believers have, now there's not a lot of information given about that, but believers have to go somewhere when God's going to destroy this world and what we see is that, that the resurrection of the dead, of the unjust that are standing before God, the judgment of Christ, well, the believers that, that 
we're all living on the earth through that millennial reign of Christ, something has to happen to them. I believe that the angels are going to reap the world at that time and that's when the wicked are being cast into the lake of fire. They're bound up and cast there first. That's my opinion on this. You know, I, other than that, I would also just say this is, this is a parable and is not really meant to give the full timing of all of the events like we get in Revelation where it's all saying and then and then and then and then and then, right? Like I, I, I can take this either way is, is acceptable to me. I think that this isn't just because this is a parable giving us a lot of information and saying, yeah, there's truth here. You got children of the, of the wicked one and their end is going to be to be burned. And that is the ultimate truth from this and that there's children of God and they're going to be gathered and brought home. So I don't think this is, this is necessarily intended to give all of the fine details of the exact order of events. But um, anyways, that's, that's what I think about it. Let's continue on here because um, he continues to give more parables now about the kingdom of heaven. And these parables will teach a slightly different truth about the kingdom of heaven. Verse number 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found... He hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. So there's about a man who's, he finds this, he's, he's just out walking around in some field. He doesn't own the field. He's walking in a field, and he's like, man, he stumbles across his treasure. And it's his great treasure. So he's like, well, I'm going to hide this here because I want that treasure. So then he goes and he has to sell everything and do whatever it takes just to get that field so then he could have that great treasure. Because obviously whatever he gives... That treasure is worth so much more than anything he already had. So he's willing to give up everything just for that treasure. And then he has a similar parable here in verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. So he's trying to find good pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. These two parables now are talking about the priceless value of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Right? How, how, like, if you were to know the great riches, the great treasure, like anyone should want to give anything to be able to enter into the kingdom of God and be able to have rights and access in and out of God's kingdom just because of how great and precious and awesome it is that anyone in the right mind, if they, if they truly understood what it was about, should easily be willing to give up everything in order to have that. And this is another thing that I think pa people fail to realize. Yeah. And people can take what, you know, the words that I'm saying and try to twist them around and say, well, so do you mean that a person, that's what I mean, you have to be willing to give up your sins in order to be saved. No. But if a person truly did just under, have a good comprehension of what the kingdom of heaven was going to be like, it would, they would be nuts not to just have an attitude of saying, well, I'm willing to do whatever for it. I'm willing to do anything for it because that is of high value and that is of a high price. The problem is that most people don't even comprehend and understand how, you know, what heaven is anyways. And, and can't, don't have the faith to, to understand how, how awesome it's going to be and that it's like coming upon this treasure and going, oh man, look at this, this, this is so much treasure. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get this. And that's the attitude we ought to have, not just with our salvation, but I mean the kingdom of heaven, with all that. That's, that's what he's saying about how great it's going to be. He already said how great it's going to be, giving different examples using the trees coming up, the mustard seed, right? This is just another way of kind of explaining how great the kingdom of God is, the kingdom of heaven. Uh, let's keep reading here, verse number 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Just one more point that I want to bring up in, in regards to this being the end of the world. When Jesus comes, when, after the rapture, shortly thereafter, a few years after, the, the, during the millennial reign of Christ, 
That is not the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. That is just Jesus' reign being set up here on this earth for a thousand years. On this same earth that we live on right now. The new Jeru that the kingdom of heaven, I believe, is talking about the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven. That is established after this earth, that, that the, the heavens and the earth are destroyed and they're changed into the new heavens and the new earth. And then the new Jerusalem comes down. So that's another, I don't think I mentioned that before, but that's another reason why when, I'm, when we're talking about looking at the timing of these things here, why it might seem a little bit off because that's the event that I think this is talking about here. And again, one more parable just kind of fo follows along that same line of thinking here. Because in both situations, you've got the wicked just immediately being cast into the furnace of fire which is exactly what happens at the judgment seat, at the great white, thro excuse me, great white throne judgment of God. Um, and this is also showing, you know, there's only one of two places that people go. It says, So shall it be at the end of the world, the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just, shall cast them in the furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So you've got, see, you've got the, the net cast, there's good fish and there's bad fish. Bad fish are cast out, the good ones are kept. People need to start thinking, well, what am I going to be? Am I going to be cast out or am I going to be kept? Because there is no in-between. Right. There's, no, there's no, well, these fish are hanging out on the boat in a little aquarium or something. You know, I mean, they're, <laughs> they're good or they're bad. There's one or the other. There, there's, no, there's no extra holding tank. Verse 51, Jesus saith unto them, Have ye understood all these things? They say unto him, Yea, Lord. Then said he unto them, Therefore, every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. And this is a really cool verse. Um, my understanding of this verse is, you know, because he asked them, Well, do you understand all these things? Because he's given them a lot of parables. Do you, do you understand what I'm telling you? Do you understand about the kingdom of heaven? So, they answer him and say, yes. Then he says, therefore, every scribe which is instructed in the kingdom of heaven, he's talking about them now, they should be these ready scribes, right? They're, they're learning, they're listening, they understand the kingdom of heaven. The, you should be like a man, that's a householder, says, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. And I think any preacher of God's word, especially pastors, preachers, People should be able to take the word of God if you're a ready scribe and be able to bring forth obviously just the old things, fundamentals, basic things, but then also be able to continue to bring forth new things. Because if you're a ready scribe, you're going to be continuing to study God's word and seeing new things regularly and be able to present both the old and the new uh, of the, you know, from the truth of God's word. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 53. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence. And when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. And there's a few things I just want to point out about this last uh, portion of Scripture here. So, Jesus goes back to his hometown and he's teaching. One thing is that the people are astonished saying, well, how could he even know so much? Like, isn't this just the car? Let's look at Jesus. Like, isn't this just the son of that carpenter? That blue collar worker, he just builds things. Like, how does he know anything about the scripture? And don't we know his family? I mean, his mother's called Mary. And we know James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters. Like, we know, we know, his, we know who this guy, where this guy comes from. Who is this guy to teach us? And how does he know all this stuff? And the Bible says he didn't do very many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Because they were looking at the physical. They were looking at the flesh. They were looking at the carnal and they were focused on the carnal and not on the spiritual. Which is a completely wrong thing to be focused on. 
we ought not to be looking and being a respecter of persons when truth is being told, when truth is coming forth. We ought to be able to receive the truth even if it comes from a little child. Yeah. That's right. If it's true, it's true. The content, the spiritual things, the things of God, God's Word. Where God's Word is coming from isn't as important as it being God's Word. The physical vessel that Jesus inhabited doesn't matter. What matters is what he was saying and doing and teaching and preaching. And that's what people needed to have faith in. And you know what? You could take comfort in this anyways and just know that if people are going to reject you just because of the way that you look or because they knew you in the past, there's nothing you can do about it. That's what they did to Jesus. You know, I wish it weren't so, but that is the way it is sometimes. Um, you know, if I were, if I would have started a church in my hometown, I'm not saying it would be unsuccessful or anything like that, but a lot of people would be like, oh yeah, I know, I know Dave. Right. And many people might not want to hear anything that I have to say, regardless of what's being said, but just because, oh yeah, I know him. And that's the way it is. And that's the way you'll find probably in your own families, you know, people like, oh yeah, I'd, He's, he's acting all spiritual and stuff now, but I know, I know where he came from. And people just don't want to hear that. And it's unfortunate. It's sad. But that's why we need to go out and reach other people and just pray that God will send other people maybe to reach, to reach your family and relatives if, if they have that attitude towards you and they don't want to hear what you have to say. And do the work for someone else and God will send someone to, to another worker and laborer to, to reach your family if, if, uh, if they're just not hearing it from you. Another thing that we notice from here is that Jesus came from a family that had a minimum of seven children. This destroys the Catholic doctrine that's, that Mary was, remained a virgin after the birth of Jesus, which is stupid and ridiculous, and just trying to add more glory unto Mary than is due. I'm not, I have nothing against Mary. She's probably a great woman, right? Obviously, God saw meat for her to bear, the, the, bear Jesus Christ, but what we see taught in Scripture from Jesus and just in the, in the Bible is that we're not supposed to be focusing on the mother, on the mom, on the human vessel that, that gave birth unto him. Just like when the woman said, blessed are the paps who you've sucked, you know, like, it's like, no, actually greater is he that, that you know, is going to sit with me in the kingdom. That's, that's what we're going to be focused on, not on, not on the, the, the breasts that gave suck to, to the baby Jesus. And when they're talking about his family, he says, mentions, look, James, Joseph, Simon, Judas. That's four brothers that Jesus had. Jesus is number five of the boys. And then it says, and his sisters. Now, it's plural. There has to be at least two. So Jesus Christ came of a family of seven. I wish today's Christians could understand this also and not go, Oh, you have five children. When are you ever going to stop? Jesus came from a family of at least seven. Well, nine total, you count the parents, right? It's good enough for Jesus. It's not good enough for us. And Jesus was the firstborn. He was perfect. They could have just stopped there. Right? <laughs> hey, we've got our perfect one. What more could you ask for? <laughs> but they kept going. Maybe they thought there was going to be another perfect one later. Or something. I don't know. But no, but seriously, I, I really wish that, that, that Christians can, can not give the bad attitude towards the bigger families, which Jesus came from a normal family. And you know what? The carpenter was able to provide for his seven children. Praise God. Don't tell me that you have to have the best paying job in the world to be able to support a bigger family. Why not just have faith in God when he says that he's not going to let the righteous beg for bread? That he is going to provide and to take care of you. Man, I was able to get through the whole rest of the chapter. I don't have to worry about skipping over as much next week. 
so much, though. So, and there's a lot of things I know I glossed over tonight. Um, study out these chapters. Go home and, and, and read them again and, and dig in and dig in deeper because there's so much I just was barely able to scratch the surface on and there's so much more truth in here. Uh, uh, continue to read and to study to be able to show yourself approved unto God. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for all the great teaching and doctrine that we get from your word. Lord, I pray that you'll please just help us to continue to understand more and to grow in our faith. And Lord, I pray that you will please just help us all to be strong. Help us to be like the seed that's planted in the good ground and that we could bring forth much fruit regularly, dear Lord. Help us not to be choked with the cares of this world or to um, be offended when persecution and tribulation comes, dear Lord. But please just help us to get rooted down and, um, and strengthened Lord, build our church to help us to reach more people. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.